sure. Very good. All right, well, good evening, everybody. It's good to have you here. This is the sixth annual uh, Cardinal Glennon Philosophical Lecture, and it also um, falls on the 10th anniversary of the philosophy program uh, here at Cardinal Glennon College. And so tonight we're delighted to have one of our own in-house professors, Dr. Randy Colton, present to us. And I'll give you a brief synopsis, a recap of uh, Dr. Colton's curriculum vitae. Uh, he was a graduate with his BA in philosophy from Wheaton College in Illinois. Uh, in 1997, he got his MA in philosophy from Baylor University. Uh, and then he came here to St. Louis, uh, where he got his doctorate in philosophy. In 2004, with his dissertation, Moral Philosophy as Moral Pedagogy, Virtues of Teaching and Learning in Kierkegaard's Implied Narratives. Uh, Dr. Colton has been here at Kenrick Glennon uh, since the philosophy program came in house in 2007 and became a full professor in 2012. Uh, and so we're very glad to have him with us. While he did all of that, he also happened to marry a very nice woman named Kristen uh, and is the uh, father of eight children. Uh, and so a devoted uh, husband and father, great philosopher, who's here to present to us tonight on gratitude and the longing for home. So please welcome our own Dr. Randy Colton. Thanks. Thanks for coming. There's so many other things you could do on a rainy Monday night, I'm sure. So appreciate your coming to hear our talk tonight. So why gratitude and the longing for home? Right? That's, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the motivation behind this topic. Let's start by looking back. So uh, as Father Martin was saying, 10 years ago, uh, we had a big change in the seminary. Right? This is, a, this is a, a headline from the Herald, our very own Herald. Right? So 10 years ago, we had a change from the, in the seminary as we moved the philosophy program from SLU back to our own environs, right, where we were uh, once again giving the degree in philosophy. So it was a, it was a big change and uh, not undertaken lightly. Here's how, at the time, this is also from the Herald article a little bit later on, how Arch, the then Archbishop Burke uh, talked about this, uh, this big change, right? He said, Archbishop Burke, highlight the purpose of the new program of studies to prepare seminarians for sacred theology, to study Aristotelian and Thomistic philosophy, because that's so essential to your intellectual formation as priests, to be a herald of truth, to speak the truth in love, to be prepared for that. You need this kind of philosophy. That's what the seminary has always thought. And so when, uh, when he brought the, uh, Archbishop Burke brought the program back here, in beginning in the fall of 2007, a lot of people worked very hard to make all those goals met. So some people uh, that are here still, some people that are back again, Father Brennan, you all know Father Brennan, he worked very hard to set this program up. Uh, some people, Monsignor Cronin, Monsignor Wachiski, that you may know from the Archdiocese that are uh, not here now. Right, all of these people worked very hard uh, to all these people work very hard to make these goals met, and I think we've succeeded in a lot of ways. Right? And uh, with certainly with the help, not only those who were there at the start, but all through our 10 years of our program, Dr. Finley came on uh, and uh, picked up the ball and ran a long way with it. Right? So we have, uh, we've had a lot of people working very hard to make this program uh, fulfill its high aims. And so I know I'm grateful to have had the chance to be a part of this from the beginning of it. And I think that uh, you and your predecessors in the College Seminary are grateful too, or you ought to be at least, right, that you've had this gift from the Archdiocese, from the seminary, be part of this program that's focused on Aristotelian and Thomistic philosophy, prepare you to proclaim the truth in love. Right, so there's a, so that, that theme of gratitude, I thought, fit just perfectly tonight. So we look back over 10 years to think with gratitude about what we've been given is a worthy task. Right, but I have a more personal sense of gratitude tonight, too. I, I was the first full-time hire in the program, uh, which was a great honor, but, uh, but I, even before I was hired, 
Whoa. If I'm here, I don't, here we go. Even before I was hired, uh, Jack Doyle was brought on. So Jack Doyle was a professor at St. Louis University. He was one of my professors when I was in the PhD program. And as soon as he heard what was going on, he was just, he was just retired from SLU, earned uh, with a well-earned rest in retirement. He was emeritus philosopher, philosophy of faculty from SLU at the time, and he immediately offered his services. Uh, to, to Archbishop Burke to help with this program. And so he was, he was on board even before I was, teaching a semester, a class or two each semester. And so when I came uh, back to St. Louis and rejoined uh, and joined the program here, I was rejoining one of my own professors from grad school. And that was a real privilege for me. Uh, so it's, uh, some, of y'all, some of y'all may have this experience. Uh, as you go back, you may find yourself working in a parish or even back at the seminary with people uh, who helped to form you uh, when you were in a formation stage, and that's the way I was. Jack had already been a mentor to me. When I was in grad school, he volunteered his time to tutor me in Latin, even though I wasn't one of his students. Uh, He volunteered his time there, but as we worked together in this new program, his mentorship for me just got even deeper. But more than that, uh, he became a friend too. Jack was a giant among scholars. Right? So if you know, if you're one of the uh, people deep into late scholastic philosophy, this is your man. You know him. He, has a, he had a worldwide reputation. If you went to Germany, you went to Portugal, you went to South America, uh, people knew his name because of the work he'd done, especially with this guy, his good buddy, uh, Francisco Suarez. Right? So that was, uh, that was Jack's... Uh, that was Jack's specialty. His special focus was on Francisco Suarez, and the story of how he came to that is, I think, worth telling, as I'm sort of paying my debt of gratitude and of honor to my mentor uh, before we talk more deeply about the virtues involved there. Uh, Jack was a student of Eshin Gilson at the University of Toronto. His dissertation director was Joseph Owens, who was one of Gilson's students. So these are some of the biggest names in 20th century Thomism. And uh, Gilson built his project around a certain diagnosis of uh, Western thought, in which Francisco Suarez figured as one of the great enemies of true Thomism. Suarez had really messed things up, Gilson thought. And now Gilson was putting them back right. Uh, and, uh, And a lot of people were joining him in that effort. Jack was one of them. So Jack thought, well, you know what? I'm going to go study Suarez for my PhD, and then I'll be able to really drive the nail in the coffin, just like my teacher says. He went and he read Suarez, and the more he read, the more he thought, hey, this stuff's pretty interesting. This guy's got something to say. Right? This, there's some stuff worth thinking about here. Now, sure enough, at the end, Doyle still agreed with Gilson, and he didn't give up his critique. Uh, the, some of the basic parts of that critique, but he found a lot in Suarez to admire and to learn from. And that's part of his, his attitude of openness to the truth uh, that we'll see is connected in a certain way to gratitude later on. So, uh, so Jack was, a, Jack was a, 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 a man of a great reputation on these, uh, on these topics. He had broad learning from the pre-Socratics. He published on Heidegger. Uh, and he can name you chapter and verse right down to article and objection number in uh, any topic you asked about in Thomas. Right, so for all those reasons, he had the, the background. He had the skills to help us, to help me, as we prepared a whole new curriculum, a new program uh, that could carry on this Thomistic tradition. Right, so he was such a great mentor for me. But more than that, he was a good friend right, for, for this and, and other reasons. Jack was unassuming. He was kind, he was funny, right? and, uh, and he had a keen eye for the foibles of academic politics. Right? There's a saying that uh, academic politics are the nastiest kind around because so little is at stake. Right? And, and, and Jack had a, a keen eye for, uh, for the kind of, of uh, sordidness and triviality of much of what went on, what goes on in academic battles. He never really got the recognition he deserved in his own, in his own place, in his own time, in his own institutions. Across the continent, across oceans, yes, but right here at home, he didn't really get what he deserved. And he knew that, and it was all part of those academic politics. Uh, but you know what? He was never bitter about it. He was never bitter. And he was in the midst of all the vanity 
and the politics of academia, and there's a lot of vanity in politics there. In the midst of all that, he was a different kind of character. Right? The kind of character he was was the kind that C.S. Lewis talks about in his, uh, his address, The Inner Ring. So you can find this in his book, The Weight of Glory. And I, I really recommend you read this essay, The Inner Ring, The Weight of Glory, also really good for you to read. But tonight we're going to think about The Inner Ring in just a minute. Here's what, uh, here's what, what Lewis says about um, advising you about how to avoid what he calls The Inner Ring and what that means will emerge as we read this quote. Let's look at this together. Lewis says, If in your working hours you make the work your end, you will presently find yourself all unawares inside the only circle in your profession that really matters. You will be one of the sound craftsmen, and other sound craftsmen will know it. This group of craftsmen will by no means coincide with the inner ring, or the important people, or the people in the know. It will not shape the, uh, that professional policy or work up that professional influence which fights for the profession as a whole against the public nor will it lead to those periodic scandals and crises which the inner ring produces. But it will do those things which that profession exists to do, and will in the long run be responsible for all the respect which that profession in fact enjoys, and which the speeches and advertisements cannot maintain. Right? He gives us a contrast here. In, in any profession you're in, he says, there's going to be that group, that inner circle, that you want to be a part of because they're the ones in the know. They're the cool kids from high school. It continues, right? It's not just high school. There's that inner ring. And you will be tempted to compromise in order to get in that inner ring. Right? In, in, a, in a seminary context, the word might be clericalism right? and career advancement. Uh, you know, Pope Francis has warned so many times priests and seminarians to avoid this treatment of the priesthood as if it were a, a way to make a, a profession, a career, to advance and to get to the better and plumber assignments. Right? Lewis is saying the same thing is a temptation for all of us, whether we're ordained or lay. Right? And that inner circle, that inner ring corrupts the work that is supposedly about. Right? But the sound craftsman who just does his work, in, in Jack's case, that meant he spent untold hours in the Vatican Film Library at the St. Louis University poring over medieval manuscripts that had been forgotten by most. Right? For That's what it meant for Jack. For you, it means in a humble parish, right, you are saying Mass, you're hearing confessions, you're counseling, you're doing the work of a pastor that may, nobody may notice outside the boundaries of that parish, but it's the work that you're called to, right? You do that, says, Jack, says, says Lewis, you do that, you do it well, and you will find some others who are also sound craftsmen. There can be a friendship there. It won't be the inner ring, but it'll be a true friendship, so it won't be a corrupting uh, friendship either. It won't be a corrupting circle. Jack was that kind of craftsman. Uh, Lewis points out this is what's necessary for true friendship. It's that the sound craftsman has a love for what's true and for what's good just because it's true and good, not because it gives him a foothold up and gives him a higher ranking in somebody's scorecard, right? but because it's true and good. That's the, way, uh, that's the way Jack was, and that's what it makes it possible for a person to be a real friend, that openness to what's true and good just because it's true and good. Jack was like that. I could always count on him for a sympathetic ear, for a kind word, a funny story, probably for more encouragement than I really deserved. I could always count on Jack, too, for a prayer. Jack was an old Irishman. He was raised in the slums of Boston back when it was an Irish, uh, an Irish monolith. Right? And, and he did not wear his spirituality on his sleeve, right? uh, not at all. But he was a man of deep faith, and so when he was quick to volunteer to say a prayer for any need I had, any need my family had, you knew he meant it, right? You knew that he, was, this is, he didn't throw off pious little sayings. If he said he was going to pray, he was going to do it, and he was so quick to make those promises. He said that often. I don't know how many times he must have prayed for me in his, uh, in his, own, in his own prayer time. At his memorial... Uh, Monsignor Cronin told us about the pattern of his daily prayer. Right? He had an acrostic that he used as a guide for his, for his pattern of prayer. It begins with a door, 
Right? He comes into the presence of God and he adores him. Then he returns thanks. Then he would beg forgiveness. Then he would offer supplications. This is where I would come in. And he would offer supplications for his needs and the needs of all those who were near and dear to him. And then to end, he would return thanks. Right? Back again, the acrostic arbor is what would guide uh, who would guide that prayer? What struck me at the time here was this repetition of thanksgiving. Twice, at the beginning and end of the prayer, he, re he returns thanks. My wife and I often remarked how honestly and gracefully Jack dealt with the difficulties and indignities of old age. Right? He was well into his 80s uh, when he died. Right? And, he had, uh, and, and he, had dealt, he dealt with a lot, as we all do as we get older. He dealt with this so, so gracefully. He didn't ever sugarcoat it. He was honest about it. He was honest about the fact that it was hard. It was frustrating when his eyes started to give out, and the man lived to read. Right? Lived to read in Latin and Greek and all this, right? He lived, but his eyes started, that was hard. That was frustrating. He didn't sugarcoat that. It was embarrassing sometimes. He didn't sugarcoat that either. He just told me, this is embarrassing. Right, that I'd have to have some help to get into your big 12-passenger van right? because I didn't have a smaller car to take him to lunch in. Right? Um, but he never displayed bitterness. Right? He was honest, but not bitter. He was honest, but he wasn't full of fear or rage. Right? And as we thought about it, I think this is where the secret was. Why not? Because he was a man of conscious gratitude. Right? Every time he prayed, he would go back twice to give God thanks. He was a man of conscious gratitude. Such a man is well disposed to handle any circumstance with honesty and grace. Right? Jack was a model for my wife and me in that way of dealing with old age, but that day way of dealing with all the adverse circumstances that we come across in our lives. And I think he could be a model for all of us then of the importance and benefit of gratitude. Why is it important to develop and cultivate gratitude? So you can be a man like Jack. So you can be a man who can handle those adverse circumstances, both now when you're older, with honesty, but with grace and without bitterness. Right? That's what gratitude uh, can bring us. So it's important for us to think about gratitude, I think, in our circumstances as we reflect back on our 10 years of our program, but also as we think about the benefits that come to us in our character and the men we become as we develop and cultivate this kind of virtue. All right, so that's gratitude. But why the longing for home? Right. Well, this is, this is home, right? For some of for us, for y'all, this is home, right? This is for, we all have our own homes, sure, but this becomes a home for you and for all of our graduates. Right? Home is the place where we start. Home is the place we move out from. It's the initial stage. All of us have homes outside these walls, but for you as priests, this place will always be home. This is your starting point in that new life. This is where you're formed to take on a new way of being, that ontological difference that ordination makes. Right? So in an important way for you, this is your starting point. This is home. Right? So it's worth thinking about, uh, I think about how home and gratitude can go together. Let's think now for a little bit about home. Talked about uh, a paragon, an exam exemplar of gratitude. Let's think a little bit about home. You may know the story, of course you do, the story of Penelope and Odysseus, right? So this is the end of the Odyssey, Penelope and Odysseus embracing, right? And that whole story is about one deep desire, the deep desire for home, the longing for home. That's what that story is about, and that story is really a story about all of us. We all have a deep desire for home, right? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that we all have a desire to go to our particular home right now or at any time. That's because when we talk about this longing for home, we're talking about the place from which we start, but we're also talking about the place where we can return to find rest and peace, right? So this story of Odysseus is the story of going away and coming back, right? And when you come back, you find the rest and peace that you missed while you were out on the way. Home is the place we start from, and it's a place we can return to find rest and peace. It's the place where we belong, right? Home is a place where we belong, where we are at home because we fit, 
we belong. Right? That's, that's what home is like. That's what home is. And that's why we have a deep longing for. We all have a deep desire to be in that place where we fit, where we belong, where we can be at rest. And we know that somehow that place has to be the place we came from. Right? So that's what, that's what goes into our longing for home. But, of course, Thomas Wolfe told us uh, very famously that you can't go home again. Right? You can't go home again. That's, we all know that. Everybody says, you can't go home again. And that stings because we want to go home. That phrase would never have become uh, famous and enduring if it weren't for the fact that it contravenes our deep desire. It's, it's famous to us. It's had its long-lasting effect because we feel the frustration in it. We want to go home, but we can't, says Thomas Wolfe. We can never find our origin and our end our starting point and our resting point together. They don't seem to come together. The homes we know don't give us that kind of rest. Right? That's, what, uh, that's what Thomas Wolfe is telling us. And the reason why Thomas Wolfe is on to something there, he's on to something there, because surely it is the case that as much as we love our parents, as much as we love our homes, for most of us, sometimes those homes can stimulate that desire for rest and peace and belonging, but not fulfill it. Right? They sometimes, for some of us in very difficult circumstances, our real homes are even countersigns of the rest we seek. Right? So what's going on here? Listen to C.S. Lewis again. This is from uh, his novel, Till We Have Faces. Right? Again. I'm broken record here, but another Lewis piece worth reading, right? The novel, Till We Have Faces, his last novel. In that novel, he's, uh, he's retelling the story of Cupid and Psyche. Right? So the, y'all know this, this myth. It's, well, it's, um, it's like, uh, what's the fairy tale? Uh, Beauty and the Beast, right? So it's, it's that kind of story, right? And, and the story, in the story as Lewis tells it, the a daughter of a king who is taken is is uh, is a, there's a daughter of a king in a time when the kingdom is suffering famine and there's disaster looming on the nation and the king's counselors tell him look what you've got to do is offer a sacrifice to the god of the mountain and then the famine will end right and then we'll recover you've got to offer sacrifice but even more it turns out that sacrifice has to be your daughter You've got to offer your daughter as a sacrifice to the god of the mountain. And so the king decides to do that. So, and, and, that's, uh, and he is, so that daughter who's about to be sacrificed is in a conversation with her sister, and her sister is outraged. How could this happen? How could they do this to you? We have to get away. We have to run away. We have to stop this. And the daughter who's to be sacrificed, the sister, she says, no. No, I, I want to do this. I want to go up to the mountain and become a sacrifice. I, and the, her sister can make no sense. So this is how that sister, who's about to be sacrificed, this is how she tries to make sense out of her peace at this horrible prospect. She says, the sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing to reach the mountain, to find the place where all the beauty came from, my country, the place where I ought to have been born. Do you think it all meant nothing? All the longing, the longing for home? For indeed, it now feels not like going, but like going back. Right? So she says, I am going home. For all my life, I've had this, this deep desire that's pulling me to the mountain. Now I'm going. That, that mountain, that's home. I'm not going away. I'm going back, though she'd never been there. She'd never been there, but she feels like she's going back. What's Lewis telling us here? He's telling us that home is a sign of something deeper. Right? The homes we have are signs of our ultimate starting points and our ultimate rest. Right? That's what we're looking for. So our, 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 uh, our parents, as Thomas points out, are indeed the causes of our being, but even more than that, so they're a starting point for us, but even more than that, of course, God is the origin of our being and our ultimate starting point, and so our ultimate end. Our parents, our homes, are the instruments 
of God's love. They are the signs of God's love in varying degrees of faithfulness and transparency. They are the signs of God's love, but they are not the full reality. The reality transcends them. So the, the, the fullness that we're looking for, what we want to find is the reality, not just the sign. And sometimes the signs are not very faithful or transparent. Sometimes, even when they are, they're not fully satisfying because they're not the reality. Right? We want this desire for home, it turns out, as a desire not. I, I, was, I was, grew up at 4431 Live Oak Drive in Mesquite, Texas. I, I can, I've seen that. My parents no longer live there, but you can look at it on Google Earth. You know, right? So it's kind of cool to look at my house that I grew up in, much smaller than when I was there. It's a little bitty thing, right? But that's not where the desire for home is really leading me. Right? That's a sign of where it's leading me. Right? So when we think about it that way, we can see that in a way Thomas Wolfe is right. If you, you can't go home again, if that means trying to find the ultimate resolution of your story, in merely the sign of your home and not the reality. That's where his characters go wrong. They're trying to find in a sign the reality, but you have to go through the sign to the reality. T.S. Eliot is closer to the mark on this. Right? So his uh, series of poems, Four Quartets, very beautiful poems, he says in one of the parts of that, of that uh series of poems he says in my beginning is my end and then at the end of that section in my end is my beginning that's the desire for home we've been talking about right? in my beginning that's the place I come back to to rest but the place I come back to to rest that's where I started right so there's a, so we're catching that circular movement away and back right? and Elliot puts it puts it uh, again in this way further on he says we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time, because we'll know it for the first time as a sign of a deeper reality, and that's when we'll know it truly, and that's when we'll know how we can go on to something more, right? If Eliot is right, our deep desire for home for finding our beginning in our end, our end and our beginning, it can find satisfaction, but only when we go back to the ultimate starting point and don't try to stop ourselves short and rest in the sign. Right? Thomas would certainly agree with this. So now we'll move on uh, into, uh, into some of Thomas's metaphysics that make sense of some of this. Right? So Thomas, Thomas would agree with this, uh, and so would this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, shadowy figure over here, right? A pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. And so uh, a figure that had great authority in the Middle Ages. He was identified with the Dionysius in the book of Acts, that St. Paul converts at Mars Hill when he talks to the philosophers, and the philosophers, they don't really prove very receptive audience, right? But one of them, one of them does. That's Dionysius. And so he was, he was uh, uh, his writings were associated with almost apostolic authority. It turns out he wasn't really that Dionysius. It was a later writer who wrote these. But for Thomas, his thought was very important, not just because of the authority, but because of the truth that Thomas found in it. Right? So Dionysius was a Neoplatonist. So you know about Platonism. Right? So you've studied the symposium and dialogues like that. You know this whole sort of platonic thing where you're going to go uh, from the up, you know, up through the uh, up through the the uh, various levels and layers and lines of reality to get back to the good, the one. And remember, you're getting back because on the theory, that's where we came from. Right? We come from the good, and we come into the body, and then we learn philosophy, so we know how to die and go back to the good. Right? So that there's that again, that movement away from the origin, then back to it. Right? That's part of the platonic, as a platonic motif that Dionysius picks up and other philosophers like that. And Thomas learns to use the same pattern. He put it this way, a thing is perfect insofar as it has returned to its principle. 
Right? A thing is perfect insofar as it's returned to its principle. In other words, nothing is fully mature, complete. So perfect. When we say perfect, I mean, we've just been watching the, the Winter Olympics, perhaps. You know, they have those sort of pseudo sports where they have the judges. You know what I'm talking about, right? And you get so many points, right? All right so a perfect 10 would be perfect, but nobody really gets a perfect 10. Right? Okay, that's not what Thomas means when he says perfect. It's not some arbitrary judgment on a sliding scale. When he says perfect, he means mature, complete. Right? So something is, has uh, fulfilled its potencies, its potential. Uh, that's what he means. So he says nothing has really fulfilled its potencies. Nothing has become mature and complete until it has returned to its principle. Uh, that's, the, that's the platonic theme that Thomas is taking up. But Thomas thinks it's not just the Platonists who own this principle. Thomas thinks, you know what, it's in Aristotle too. Uh, and so there are things that Aristotelians say about causality. Right? Every agent produces its like. Every effect turns naturally to its cause. Right? These kinds of, uh, of, of axioms about causality, just another way to say this same thing. Right? What, is, what comes from a cause is complete and mature when it returns back, when it is somehow like its cause. Here are some examples. Right? We've got uh, a blueprint over here. Right? So a house, a blueprint, an architect's idea of what a house is going to be, it's not really, the house isn't really complete until it fully instantiates that idea. And that's, then it's become like its cause, it's returned to its principle. Right? Or we have a family, right? A child is not mature and complete until that child is ready to be a mother or a father, like the mother or father that he or she came from. Right? That's what it is to be a mature and complete adult is readiness for fatherhood or motherhood which is to say you've become like your source. Right? You've returned to your principle. So this is a, this is a, a kind of insight that, is, uh, that goes throughout all layers of being, thanks Thomas, but is true in particular for us. Right? Now, when we return to our principle, we return to our principle in the way that's proper to us. Right? So different things, a house returns to its principle by being built and having the right uh, brickwork and the right siding, whatever. But for us, we are free creatures. Right? We are creatures who choose and who act. So we return to our principle through our acts, through our choices. In other words, through our virtues. Right? So it's the virtues that are our road back home. Right? That's how we return to our principle. In particular, Thomas talks about four virtues that have this kind of structure. Four virtues that are our road back home. So he starts with religion. And for, for Thomas, religion is the virtue that's preeminent among all the moral virtues. Religion is the highest and best. He gives it the pride of place because it's the moral virtue that has to do exactly with our relation to our first cause, to our principle and origin, and so to our end. All right now, on Thomas's view, religion is a kind of justice. Right, have y'all talked about this in ethics yet this semester? So, no, okay, so we'll go through this then. Right, so religion is a kind of justice. It's a, it's a part of the virtue of justice. Now, justice has to do with paying back uh, debts. Right, it's the habit of giving to each what is due. That's what justice is. Paradigmatically, it's when the buyer gives the right money to the seller for what he's receiving. Right? So you get an exactly equal exchange there. Right? If, uh, if, if I'm going to buy a candy bar, then I have to give them exactly what it's worth, and they have to give me a candy bar that's worth exactly what I give. Right? So we get this even exchange, this exact exchange. And in those cases, we can usually have a rule. There's a law that governs that and says you've got to give exactly what you get. But there are other cases where what is due can't really be fully repaid, or it can't be specified very exactly. And the debt we owe God is one of these cases. Right, so God is our ultimate principle. We owe him everything. We can't give him back everything, because everything we give back comes from him. So we can't make that exchange e even. We can never make that exchange equal. Right, so here's a case where we have to give what's due, but we can't give it in the, the full way that it seems to demand. 
right? We, we owe him reverence. We owe him thanksgiving. We owe him honor. We owe him all these acts of the virtues of religion, devotion, prayer, sacrifice, adoration, right? None of them actually measure up to what we owe, right? So all these, but, but that is, so that's a special kind of virtue. That's why Thomas distinguishes it from justice, because it, it can't ever really be fully satisfied. But nonetheless, we do give back. And in that is our road back home. So all these acts of the virtue of religion that Thomas talks about. He spends a great deal of time talking about each of these acts, devotion, prayer, sacrifice, adoration. Right? Each one of those is our way back home. Right? The psalmist says in Psalm 83, <clears throat> the psalmist says, where else should the sparrow find a home? The swallow a nest for her brood, but at thy altar, Lord of hosts, my King and my God, how blessed Lord are those who dwell in thy house they will be ever praising thee. Right? There the, the psalmist says, the temple, God's temple, the place of sacrifice where I enact the virtue of religion, that's home. That's home. That's where I've come back to my origin. And so all of these, that's, religion is the preeminent way in which that happens. But it's not the only way. So besides religion, Thomas talks about piety. Because we have, besides our ultimate origin, we have secondary principles too. God is our ultimate principle and so our ultimate home. But we have these secondary principles too. Right? So from our parents, from our country, we have the principle of our generation and of our maturity. Our parents bring us to be and they are our primary educators and raise us and form us. Right? And our country is the context in which that can happen. So Thomas says to your parents and to your fatherland, you owe a debt of piety. Right? So piety is the virtue by which we give the honor that's due to our parents and to our country as our principles. Right? So that's the virtue of piety. Then there's the virtue of observance, what he calls observance. We don't use that word very much, not in this way, not as a virtue name. But for Thomas, it's the virtue that enables us to give back what we owe to those who are our mentors or to those who hold authority over us, right? So it could be either someone actually in authority or it could be someone who deserves to be in authority but isn't, right? Deserves it because of his excellence. And so there's, our mentors are often that way. They may, they may be in authority over us officially or they may not be officially in authority but they have the excellence that goes with it, right? Either way, they too are principles for us. And from them, we learn how to achieve excellence right? in, our, in our virtues, in our personal, in our character, in our personal way of being, or in some skill or acquired habit. Right? So they too are our principles. So by the virtue of observance, we give to them uh, what's due. Right? That's what I spent the first few minutes of this lecture doing, paying my debt of observance to a mentor who had been, for me, a principle of a way of being in my own life. Right, so there's observance. But then finally, there's gratitude. And in gratitude, we give due thanks in return to our benefactors. Because our benefactors, anybody who gives us anything, is in a way a starting point for us. Right, so if uh, someone gives us a, uh, a gift, now we possess something we didn't before. There's a new start. Maybe a little. Maybe seem trivial, but it is a new start. Now we exist as possessing this thing. That's new. Right? So we have a principle. We have, uh, an, 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 and therefore we have an origin. We have a, uh, we have a home. Right? So the virtue of gratitude, each time we give thanks, we're going back home. We're slaking that desire for home by treating the signs of home with their due respect. Right, so all these virtues are the royal road back home. These are the ways we return to our principle. And while a lot of times these virtues, I think, are sort of overlooked and thought of as more or less the sort of minor league of the virtues, they're actually really important. Right? And they're really a part of what allows us to have that equanimity of character that uh, that I talked about in Jack. Because when you practice these virtues, you come to see yourself as fitting. Right? You, you belong. And that's part of what helps us to achieve that kind of peace. Right? So they're important virtues for us to think about. We're going to think about, in particular, gratitude. 
Right? So gratitude. All right. If we think about gratitude, we're thinking about an emotion and a virtue. Right? So you feel thankful sometimes, and then you give thanks. Right? So there's an emotion and there's a virtue involved. We feel grateful when we recognize that something has become ours that wasn't before. Something we could have been without is now ours. Right? So how does that feeling? And then when we've developed our responses so that we feel that at the right time in the right way and we act on it, we have the virtue of gratitude. Right? Now, some people think that you can have the virtue of gratitude sort of just as a form of appreciation. So you see a beautiful natural landscape, right? Some beauty, some beautiful tree, some beautiful sunset, some, some kind of, of beauty in the world that uh, you find in its natural environment, its natural reality, and, and your heart wells up with the goodness of it, its beauty, its sheer contingency. Right? Somebody says, some people think, well, look, that's gratitude. That's an experience of gratitude, just you and this, and this event that happened. Thomas disagrees. Thomas thinks that gratitude always has to have three parts. Right? There are always three parts. It's not just a gift and a receiver. There has to be a giver. A giver, a gift, and a receiver. Right? Now, the gift itself has two parts, because on the one hand, there's the thing that's given, but on the other hand, there's the movement of the heart that leads to the thing that's given. So there's the heart, and then there's the gift. And for Thomas, the reason why this this triadic structure is important, this three-part structure, is because the gift is like a sign that tells us about the giver. Right? The gift is a sign of the goodwill of the giver, the heart of the giver. When we respond to a gift, we're responding to someone's heart. Right? And that's what, makes it, uh, that's what makes it so important. In the same way, when you have a sign, you have a, uh, uh, that same kind of relation. Think about a stop sign. Right? So you're driving down the road, the light turns red, right? and that immediately, what do you do? Okay, this is St. Louis, you roll through it. But I, really, what are you supposed to do, right? You step on the brake, right? You step on the brake. Why? Because that sign has made present to your awareness a command. Stop! And you, being a good citizen, are obeying, right? The sign is not the red light in itself that's important. It's what the red light makes you aware of. So in the Thomistic tradition, John St. Thomas, for instance, says that a sign is that which represents something other than itself to a cognitive power. A gift is the same way. It's something that represents something other than itself to the receiver. It represents the heart of the giver, the goodwill of the giver. And that's really, Thomas thinks, what's more important. When we think about our own return of thanks, he says the main thing to pay attention to is not what's given, but the heart that it signifies. And, that's, and, and you, you may remember when you were a child, or you may have nephews and, and nieces now that can bring this to mind, right? Little kids all the time give you all kinds of junk. It's junk, right? It really is. And you gotta find a place to put it, and that's a little annoying. But you know what? It's a sign of their heart. And that's what the mom and the dad respond to, or the uncle or the aunt. That's what you respond to, the sign of the, of the giver's heart. Right? So a gift is a sign. Thomas says, God alone sees man's disposition in itself. We don't read other people's hearts. We can't. But insofar as that disposition is shown by certain signs, then we can know it. It is thus that a benefactor's disposition is known by the way in which he gives the benefit Especially, for instance, if someone gives a benefit joyfully and readily, even if it's not much of a benefit, it shows the heart, right? And that's what you respond to. So for Thomas, it's really important that you see all three aspects of this exchange, right? So, but, so what do we say then about a beautiful, natural beauty like this, right? This is, this is actually... Uh, as seen from our yard, right? that's a, a picture taken by one of my daughters, right? and we've got a beautiful tree, we've got the heavens uh, lighted with the glow of sunset, it's a beautiful thing. Right? We respond to it. What's going on in that response? Well, a couple of, of verses help us to understand. St. James tells us, every good and perfect gift comes from above. And the psalmist tells us, 
The heavens declare the glory of God. Day unto day pours forth speech. Right, so what are these verses telling us? And they're telling us that everything, if it's good, it comes from God. So every good thing that comes to us is a sign of God's goodwill. Every good thing that comes to us is a gift that signifies God's goodwill. Right, and the heavens are one of those things. Right? The psalmist says the heavens declare they are signs. Uh, so when we see this, when we see this, uh, this, this sunset, this beautiful tree, right, some people want to say, oh, it's just, there, there isn't a giver, you just like the thing. But no, there always is a giver. For every good gift, there always is a giver, and that's God. Right? I told my daughter this philosophical theory, right? I said, well, some people say it's just, you know, you just appreciate it, and there's not, a, she said, well, God made the sunset. Like, yeah, right, and that's, that's the point. That's the point. Everything comes from God. And so everything is a sign, uh, a gift that it reveals his heart. Even the gifts we receive from others then always deserve a kind of double gratitude. When we receive a gift from one of our friends, that it reveals first, in a way, the, the friend's heart, but it also reveals the heart of God because the goodness in the gift comes from God. Right, so, that, so there is always in every act of gratitude, in every gift, and so in every act of gratitude, there is this, um, there is this, this response to a heart, to a person, to a giver, right? all the way through our lives in every kind of way. Uh, in fact, our whole life, uh, St. Uh, John Paul II, a very taught of splendor, tells us that our, um, tells us that our whole, our whole moral life is really a gift and a thanksgiving. Right? He says in Veritatis Splendor, the moral life presents itself as a response due to the many gratuitous initiatives taken by God out of love for man. Right? Our whole life, our whole moral life in a way, is all gratitude. Because it's always responding to the gifts that God has given us. God always has the initiative. He's always the giver. And we're always responding. Right? So the whole moral life is this kind of of a great act of gratitude that covers, as should, our entire life. Right, so all of this, this the, the reality of gratitude in this three-part structure permeates every aspect of our being, every, every day and every act and every experience that we have. You can see how it would also be related to justice and to community. This is really interesting. Thomas says that, in a way, gratitude comes before justice, or at least generosity does, right? Thomas says, justice is giving what's due. But how do you know what's due? Well, you know what's due because it fits the reality of things. Well, where did that come from? That came from creation. Thomas says, the act by which a, a person first acquires something of his own cannot be an act of justice, but by the act of creation, a created thing first possesses something of its own. Justice is about our own, what's due. Creation, which is gift, comes before that. Right, so our, really our communities all have their origin, not in justice, but in gift. So gratitude is the glue that holds those communities together. And if you know this man, this is Jean Vanier, who founded a, uh, a collection of communities called the L'Arche Communities all across the world in which mentally disabled adults live together with uh, non-mentally disabled adults, not in a caretaker-patient relationship, but as a community together, in an intentional community. And according to Vanier, at the heart of a well-functioning community is celebration, and celebration is thanksgiving. Uh, it's in celebration, in thanksgiving, that we remember who we are as a community. We give thanks for being a community, for being one, and for being the kind of community that we are. And in our celebrations, we symbolically bring to mind our end, and therefore also our beginning. Right? And especially, of course, this is clear in the Eucharist. Right? In the Eucharist, which is a great act of thanksgiving, and Vanier points this out. He says, we begin the celebration by asking for forgiveness. We complete it in thanksgiving. Right? Because in the Eucharist, we have not just a symbol of our end, but our end really present, body and blood. 
soul, and divinity. Christ, whose presence is our heart's true home, is really present. And in the, uh, in the Eucharist, we have, as Lumen Gentium, Lumen Gentium tells us, right, a genuine sacrifice. Vanier agrees, sacrifice is at the heart of community. Why is that? Well, the deepest reason, I think, is this. Because at the heart of community is thanksgiving. We need to give return thanks to God for our being as a community. But there's nothing we have that fits the gift God has given us except another gift he has given us, his son. Right? So we return the only gift we have that is fitting for such a gift in the first place. Right? It's gift. We return a gift and thanksgiving for a gift. And that's all caught up in the Eucharist. Right? The community offers the sacrifice of the Holy Mass as our return to our first principle in thanksgiving. Right, so we have there, too, in the Holy Mass, the ultimate return to our first principle for each of us individually, for the church as a whole, for the whole cosmos. Right, it's right there in the Mass. Right, so Thanksgiving, we've seen it in the ordinary, trivial things of life, in the great moments of the liturgy. Right, all through this, gratitude is really uh, the keynote, sort of one of the uh, almost a, a droning note through all the melodies of our lives. It always comes back to that. Philosophers, of course, though, have found ways to quibble with this. You might expect that from philosophers. Right? So uh, we have here a, a French king and a French revolutionary, and we can think about a couple of obje objections that they might bring to gratitude and that some of them have. So there is what we might call the aristocratic objection. The, aristoc the aristocratic objection goes like this. Gratitude can't be, can't be good if it requires dependence on another because the truly superior person, like me, of course, is independent and self-sufficient. Have you all read about the magnanimous man in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics? I mean, he doesn't remember, he doesn't like to remember favors received. He likes to remember the ones he gives. He doesn't want to be dependent. He doesn't want to receive. He wants to be the source and the origin. He doesn't want to have to go back by someone else's act to his own origin. He wants to be the independent, self-sufficient one. Right? Gratitude doesn't fit well into that kind of self-conception. You start off with that way of thinking about yourself, you're not likely to find gratitude a helpful habit. Right? Here's another, an opposite objection. I call it the democratic objection. And it goes like this. Gratitude can't be good if it requires dependence on another because that makes us unequal. If you have gratitude, then you have an asymmetry. I am dependent on the giver. The giver is not dependent on me. I'm receiving. He's giving. Right? There's an asymmetry there. We're not equal anymore. And then, but the, for the, the Democrat, the radical Democrat, we're all equal all the time. Right? So there can't be any room for gratitude. We should not even, even, uh, even acknowledge it. Ralph Waldo Emerson had this kind of objection, thought gratitude was, um, was a, a something that, that, that doesn't really fit well into the American character. But both of these objections, I think, fail. I, I, this is Alistair McIntyre. Right? He's a, a, a living Catholic philosopher of great depth. Right? McIntyre wrote a book called Dependent Rational Animals. And in it, he gives us sort of the response to this aristocratic objection. And he says, to the virtues of the independent reasoner, those aristocratic virtues, we must add the virtues of acknowledged dependence. Here's McIntyre's point. We are embodied creatures. We all start off as babies. We end, God willing, as old people. In between, we get sick. We get disabled. We are always dependent on others. We can't get away from that. That's what it is to be a rational animal. We're not angels. We're animals. Right? So we're always dependent. So if that's true, then the excellence of a human being has to include virtues that not only allow him to be independent, but virtues that allow him to be dependent with excellence. That's what these virtues are like. That's what gratitude is. It's a virtue that makes... Uh, excellent, our capacity to depend on another. Right? So the, the virtues of knowing how, says McIntyre, to exhibit gratitude. 
That's part of being a dependent animal. So the, the mistake the aristocrat makes then is to mis make a mistake about who we are. It's what Percy Walker Percy calls angelism. The idea that we're like the angels, independent and self-sufficient. We're not, right? Likewise, the Democrat makes a mistake. So this is Søren Kierkegaard, the Danish Lutheran philosopher and theologian, another deep and profound thinker, who tells us in one place in a, when he's turning over just exactly this problem, and in a meditation on the epistle of James, he's turning over just exactly this problem about inequality in the congregation when we have givers and receivers, and he quotes the apostle's words, every good and perfect gift comes from above. And this is Kierkegaard's conclusion. Since God is the source of every good, both giver and receiver acknowledge their essential equality and absolute dependence on God, while also recognizing the accidental differences deriving from God's providence that bind them together in a kind of playful dance. Here's the idea. Right? Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So if I give you something and it's good, where did it come from? God. Ultimately, it came from God. It's not just from me. The goodness in the gift comes from God. Right? So whenever I give you something, you are depending not just on me, but on God. I'm not the source of the goodness. Right? So because we're both equally dependent on God, the goodness in the gift comes from God, we actually end up being on a level plane. I put it this way. Here's how, here's how Kierkegaard said this plays out. To be a good giver, he says, you should make yourself absent in your present. Make yourself absent in your present. In other words, you should give in such a way that the receiver's attention is directed to the source of the goodness, to God, and not to yourself. You should hide behind the gift and let the receiver see God. On the other hand, to be a good receiver... You have to be ready to thank God. And remember what else, what, what the Apostle John tells us. How can you love the God you cannot see if you don't love the man you do? In the same way, how can you thank the God you do not see if you don't thank the man you do? So to be a good receiver, you've got to search out the human giver in order to practice your thanksgiving to God. So you've got this, the giver trying to run away from the receiver, the receiver trying to chase him down. Right? It's a very playful image, but it's not just in Kierkegaard. Uh, here's a, a picture of the, the lepers. Remember the story of our Lord and the lepers in was it, Luke 17, I think, right? that uh, he heals ten lepers. Nine of them run away to the temple. They're so excited they're healed. One of them comes back to say thanks. Right? But notice how this happens. Jesus says, go your way. Right? And they go to the temple, and it's on their way to the temple. In other words, after they left Jesus, they're on, he's no longer around. When they realize, hey, I'm healed. And Jesus was absent in that present. Right? He made himself absent in his present and did not force on them a recognition of himself as the source of the gift. So he was a good giver. Nine of them were bad receivers. They didn't then go search out that human instrument of God's goodness to practice their thanksgiving to God. One of them did, and that's the one that Jesus commended. All right, so make yourself present in your absence. There, there are other images, too. Here's our good friend, St. Nicholas. We think of him as coming down the chimney, right? Uh, but here he is throwing a bag of coins in through the window. Right? I, I, this, I've always thought, oh, whoa, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, this little this this girl here looks a little scared by the whole whole episode. It seems to me, but it's a little dangerous. There's gold coins flying through the air. But but this is Nicholas is trying to do the same thing. Saint Nicholas is doing the same thing. He's making himself absent in his present because it's God who is the source of the goodness of the gift. And if we remember that, then we can realize that in our act of thanksgiving, we are not putting ourselves under someone, but we are taking advantage of someone to become closer to God by giving that person thanks. In the same way, when we give, we don't become one up. That's what the Aristotelian aristocrat wants to do. He's going to become one up with his gift. Right? Instead of becoming one up, right, we become together united in a deeper love for God. Right? So, there, uh, so there is in uh, so there is in in that, in that central insight that every good and perfect gift comes from above, a response 
to these sorts of objections. All right, one more objection and then we'll be done. All right, so uh, this is, this is a, a puzzle that's raised sometimes about gift and gratitude. The question is, are they even possible? All right, so this is, a, I take it from this from John Caputo and especially his remarks on Jacques Derrida, so these postmodern French philosophers. Here's their basic idea. Gratitude can't be good if it fulfills an obligation. Right? You have an obligation to return thanks, so here they say this is what happens. Somebody gives you a gift. As soon as you realize it's a gift, then you know you're bound to, say, to give thanks back to them, and now it's no longer a gift because you're just exchanging things. Right? So they give you a gift, and then you have to try to give them a gift back, and now we're just in the circle of exchange, and there's no free and gratuitous giving anymore. They want to say it's not even possible to give a gift. Right? Only if you forget that it's a gift can it be free. And in that case, of course, it's not a, it's not a, a gift because you don't even think of it as a gift. Right? So we have a problem. Is it even possible to give a gift? And to think about that, we have to think about the, this concept of obligation that's behind it. Modern philosophers always think about obligation in a kind of ledger format as an account. Right, so they think of it like this. An obligation is a debit in our moral bookkeeping, and we have to cancel it out somehow for it to stay even in our moral bookkeeping and not become guilty, which we are when we have some debit we have not, uh, we have not evened out. We have not somehow canceled out. Right, so actions are always a matter of cancel. Our moral action matter is trying to cancel out these debts, these debits that we have. So when we receive a gift, we get a debit in our account, and now we have to cancel it out. That's just trouble. It's hassle. Right? So Kant says, if I accept favors, I contract debts which I can never repay, for I can never get on equal terms with him. And if I do him a favor, I'm only returning a quid pro quo. I'll always owe him a debt of gratitude. Who wants that, says Kant. Kant even says, I may have to sink to subterfuge to try to avoid him when he's coming down the street because I don't want to be reminded of what I owe and I can't ever pay it back. Right, so Kant sees this as a problem. For Thomas, not so much. Thomas has a different notion of, of, uh, of, of obligation. For Thomas, obligation is not about bookkeeping. It's not evening up your debits and your moral ledger. Instead, obligation is simply about doing what's needed to reach our end. And there are different kinds of debts. There's late illegal debt. Okay, that's more like what Kant's talking about. But there's also a moral debt. And our moral debt is really something that, we, that is due for achieving our end of happiness. That's the moral obligation. Well, that's not an onerous burden. I don't want to avoid something that's due for my end of happiness. I want to do it because I want to be happy. Right? And so the reality is, the truth is, on Thomas's view, that the gift is not some onerous burden that now I have to discharge, but instead it's a wondrous reality because it offers the receiver not only the good of the benefit, the gift, but also the opportunity to achieve his end by his own creative return to the principle. Thomas says you're going to want to give back more than you get, and then what's that mean? Now the giver has become a receiver. So what's he going to have to do? Well, he's going to have to give back. He's going to want to give back more too so he can have a return to his principle. And Thomas says, that's not a problem. It's an infinite virtuous cycle. As we keep giving and exchanging these gifts, when we receive one, we're happy because we now have an opportunity to return to our principle, to achieve happiness. So we give back, and now we've created an opportunity for the other guy to do the same thing. And then he gives us a new opportunity. We give him a new opportunity. Thomas says it's infinite. It's infinite because the debt of love is infinite. And that's not a problem. That's not onerous the way that Kant thinks. That's liberating. It's freeing. It's hopeful. Promises that we can someday return to our home. Right? We can someday find a way back uh, to our principle. And that's what, what is, at the end of the day, that's what we desire. That's our deepest longing. That's what gratitude helps us to achieve. Right. So I think we'll end there. But thank you for your attention.